has taught us great things he has done and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son but pure and higher and greater will be our wonder our transport when Jesus we see well, praise the Lord praise the Lord let the earth hear his voice praise the Lord praise the Lord let the people rejoice oh come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory great things he one more time praise the Lord praise the Lord praise the Lord let the earth hear his voice praise the Lord praise the Lord let the people rejoice oh come to the Father through Jesus the Son want to speak the name of Jesus and over every heart and every mind because I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus and I just want to speak the name of Jesus us, till every dark addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom, I speak Jesus, Cause your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over fear and all anxiety. In every soul held captive by depression. I speak Jesus. Cause your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name life yes amen let's claim that in this place his name is life break every stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy and Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus shout Jesus from the mountain Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy and Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus your name is power your name is healing your name Stronghold, shine.
shine through the shadows burn like a fire let's sing that one more time shout jesus from the mountains shout jesus from the mountains jesus in the streets and jesus in the darkness over every enemy oh jesus for my family i speak the holy name jesus shout jesus from the mountain jesus in the streets and jesus in the darkness over every enemy and jesus for my family I speak the holy name. Let's speak it in this place. Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Speak your name, Jesus. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus. And over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus, and I just want to speak the name of Jesus, and over every heart and every mind, cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus, and faith pull on, and so unchanging, oh ageless one, you're my
and I call out to you again and again. Oh, I call out to you again. morning we're turning our attention to verse 7 and the attitude number 5 which I will read in a minute. But let me point out first of all that with this beatitude we have a turning point in the beatitudes. The first four that we have looked at really speak about our relationship with God and our commitment to God. And that's what I just highlighted. We recognize our weakness, our spiritual poverty. We recognize our need to repent of our sin so we can come in a right relationship with God. We recognize the need to humble ourselves before the Lord. We recognize our need to be hungry and thirsty for the things of God. So you see here, these four Beatitudes, they speak really of our relationship with and our commitment to God. But now something changes. Beatitude number five makes a bit of a shift. And it talks about, I believe, the way I see it here, the believer's relationship with others, our relationship with one another. You see, the gospel is about that. The gospel is about a relationship with God, this vertical relationship. And when we're right in that relationship, it transforms our relationships on this level, one with another. We love God and we love each other. And there's so much that the Bible says about that. So Jesus now, He shifts it seems his attention away from, he doesn't abandon it, but he shifts his attention somewhat away from the vertical relationship with God. And now he begins to talk about my relationship with you, your relationship with me. And this is what he says, blessed or deeply joyful are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. We'll look at what mercy means in a moment, but right off the bat, I'm going to say this this morning, God doesn't need our mercy, so mercy must apply to how we relate to one another. So that shift has taken place in our relationship with God, and let me tell you something, that relationship with God will impact upon a relationship with others in a positive, very positive kind of way. You cannot separate the two. So Jesus makes that transition Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. What Jesus is saying then is when we are in a right relationship with God, the first four Beatitudes, we will be in a right relationship with others. And simply put, 
that includes being merciful one to the other. Now, what does mercy mean? I want to share way, three ways this morning, and the definition of merciful will come out in this. Three ways that mercy is lived out in the life of Jesus' followers in the relationships one to another. Three ways. There's more, but I want to three, share three with you this morning. The dictionary, if you pull down any dictionary or checked online, you probably get this definition of what mercy means or merciful. It is this, to feel kindness, to feel kindness or compassion to those in need, to those who are hurting, those who are suffering, those who are in stress or distressed. That word feel, keep that in mind, to feel something to feel kindness, to feel compassion to those in need. Well, in the Greek, which is what's used here, the English version of the Greek we have, but in the Greek, the word for merciful that Jesus uses in the fifth beatitude essentially means the same thing, but as the case with many New Testament Greek words, the meaning goes a little deeper. Yes, it certainly refers to feeling something, feeling pain for someone, feeling compassion and kindness for those in need, but it goes a little bit further here. Jesus wasn't just saying that his followers will have a, just a feeling of compassion, and feelings may pass with time. Jesus was saying that those who follow me, those who are filled with mercy, will have a deep inner sense of compassion, yes, but that compassion will go further. It will compel us to do what we can to relieve the distress or the pain of those who are suffering. Very simple. It is more than just a feeling. Mercy that Jesus is talking about here is compassion plus action. It is not only feeling, it is doing. It is not only saying but it is responding. It is not only recognizing, but it is stepping up to the plate and intervening when that is possible. And there's some examples in Scripture we know that. And God is the first one that comes to mind. God saw our miserable state of sin. He could have abandoned us. He could have annihilated us. But the God who is rich in mercy felt compassion and He acted on that. Not only did He feel for us, but he acted. How did he do that? He gave his son to die so that we might live. For God so loved the world. He had a feeling for the world. He had an emotion for the world. He loved the world that he gave his only son. He acted on that feeling, on that emotion. His mercy was more than just feeling something for us. He stepped up, if I could use that phrase, and he sent his son to die for us. And whoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Titus 1 and 3 says, When the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us not because of righteous things we have done, but because of His mercy. 1 Peter 1 and 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in His great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope, to the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We are saved today because God was merciful to us. Merciful to me, a sinner. He not only saw us, He not only felt us, he, our pain, but He knew we were the ones who messed things up. Mankind messed things up in the Garden of Eden. Did God just abandon us? God felt something towards us. Love and mercy. And eventually, even before the foundation of the world was laid, God had a plan in place. And even in Genesis, just after the fall took place, God made the promise that the seed of the woman, referring to Jesus, the first promise of the Messiah, that the seed of the woman would destroy Satan's work ultimately. And Jesus came and died on the cross and rose again. And by doing so, He crushed Satan's head. And we are victorious today because of what Jesus did for us. And it's all because God loved us so much and was so merciful towards us. 
Another example, obviously, would be Jesus. Jesus obeyed the will of his heavenly Father. Jesus came to earth, and he gave his life. Jesus could have derailed the plan. In the Garden of Gethsemane that night, I believe with all my heart that Jesus could have. He could have said to his Father, this is too much. The Bible said he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood when he looked into the cup and he saw what he was about to go through for mankind. But instead of walking away, he said to his Father, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus was merciful. Mercy, not only a feeling, but mercy that prompted him to do something about it. And that meant for him a cross. Jesus dealt with our condition. He didn't just feel for us. He did something about it. We read in the Gospels that when Jesus was on earth as well, he, he, yes, ultimately He showed mercy on the cross, but in that journey to the cross, which really took about 33 years, He showed mercy in practical ways. And we could spend the whole day here this morning reading the Gospels together and reading that Jesus, when He saw people in need, He was moved with compassion, the Word says. And the phrase, moved with compassion, is more than just a feeling. It was a deep inner concern and care that prompted Him to do something. In fact, in the Greek, the word, the phrase, moved with compassion, means that there was an inner turmoil in His heart, deep down inside of Him. And no doubt we've experienced that when we see somebody and we are moved with compassion. There, there's something that happens within us and, and, and it's not pity, but we feel pain for them. We, we feel love and concern for them. I experienced that this week as I, as I went about and I saw something and, and, and it was just a, a deep inner turmoil. But for Jesus, it was more than just a feeling. He acted on it. He reached out. There was action. He did what was needed to alleviate the pain and suffering of people. And we see Jesus doing that in the Gospels over and over again. Healing, feeding, delivering, touching, raising people from the dead even. He was moved with compassion. He felt and He responded. Here in Beatitude number 5 then, Jesus is essentially saying that His followers would do the same. There's no ifs, ands, buts about it. There's no, there's no rationalizing it. There's no talking our way out of it. Jesus said, if you're truly my follower, you are going to feel the same. And you're going to act on how you feel. When you see people in need, you're going to do what you can within your ability to respond to them. You will be merciful. One of the greatest stories that Jesus told that we are familiar with is the story of the Good Samaritan. We know it well. There was this man that went on a journey and, and for whatever reason he was robbed and, and left for dead on the side of the road. He was a Jewish man. Two fellow Jews came by one day up on the scene and, and they may have been moved with compassion. They may have went and looked at the man and felt something, but they did nothing about it. They just simply passed him by. Another man comes by, this time a Samaritan. And by the way, the Samaritans and the Jews were essentially enemies. There was great animosity between the two groups. And maybe the natural inclination for the Samaritan man was to ignore the Jewish man as well. But he didn't do that. He didn't do what the other Jews did. There was something happening inside of him. So he stops and he, he goes to the Jewish man in the ditch and he acted on his feeling of mercy. And you know the story and there are at least three dimensions of mercy in this story. I'm not going to elaborate on them. I'll leave them with you. The good Samaritan, first of all, he saw the need of the man. He saw the man in distress. And he didn't turn a blind eye to it. He saw. Then he was moved internally. There was something happened inside. There was a feeling of compassion to the man. How could you? How could you see a man? I can't imagine walking down the street and seeing a person, and for me, and no doubt for you, even an animal on the side of the road. You might call me crazy, but I, I got some of the, those window wells at my house, you know what I'm talking about, in my basement, and frogs get down in there. The plague of frogs, I called it. Frogs get down in those. 
Someone came along to me the other day and said, you've you got to kill that and get rid of it. I said, no, no, I can't kill them. I've got to get rid of them. Well, yeah, but I can't kill them. I've got to get those frogs out of there, and I've got to release them. You say, Pastor, you can't kill the frog. No, can't kill the frog. You know, if we're walking down the road and we see a person on the side of the road, can you imagine just walking by? I'd like to think that all of us would respond. I'm sure followers of Jesus would. Whether it's broken physically, whether it's broken emotionally, whatever distress is, and we are made aware of that, not only do we feel, but the Samaritan, he went and he responded externally. He felt internally, and he responded externally. And we know the story. With a practical effort, he, he cared for the man. He mended up his wounds the best he could. He, he laid him on his own donkey. In other words, he put him in a cab, and he, he brought him to the local hotel, and he paid the bill. And he even said to the innkeeper, listen, if it costs more than what I've given you, if he eats more than what I think he's going to eat, or if he needs to stay more longer than I think he needs to stay, I will repay you. My next time in town, he cared for him. He not only felt for him, he cared for him. One writer put it this way about this story, an eye for distress, a heart of pity, an effort to help in spite of underlying feelings of animosity. He said that's the mercy that Jesus is talking about in Beatitude number five. Let me read that again. An eye for distress, a heart of pity, and an effort to help in spite of underlying feelings of animosity, in some case, to alleviate the pain. That's what it means to be merciful. Jesus in His Sermon on the Mount and the apostles in their writings teach us that true followers of Jesus will respond mercifully to those in need. And I say that word again, they will respond. Not that they might, but I emphasize true followers. True followers. True disciples will respond to those in need. One verse that I like is found, and there are many verses that I could use this morning, but let me leave this one with you. 1 John 3, 17, 19, first part of 19, a couple of verses. John says this, if anyone, if any of us, just think that John has stood here behind the pulpit this morning, and he says, if any of us has material possessions, We have stuff, we have resources, food, money, water. And we see a brother or sister in need, but we have no pity on them. He says, how can the love of God be in that person? How can you be, how can I be, how can I call myself a follower of Jesus if I see my brother and my sister in need and don't respond to them? The answer really is not given, but it's inferred. It can't. If you truly have the love of God, if I'm truly a follower of Jesus, I can't turn a blind eye or a deaf ear. He says, dear children, let us not love with words or speech only. Think about that. Just don't say it. Just don't say that you care, but with actions and in truth. And he says, this is how we know that we belong to the truth. He says, this is how you know. Jesus said, people will know that you're my disciples, but how much you love one another. And that love is an action word, and John picks up on this here, and he says, that's how you know you belong to the truth. That's how you know you belong to the family of God. That's one of the reasons you know that you are a follower of Jesus if you have love that's moved with compassion and moved to respond Now, I know, let's be realistic. We can't meet every need that's out there. We cannot provide everything that everyone may need. But when God, by His Holy Spirit, prompts us, and I believe God does that, I believe God puts us in the path of someone else to minister to their need. I know I'm live here, and I want to be careful, but my wife and I were in a a, a grocery store. I won't name it the other day. And there was an individual there that was having trouble trying to pay for his, his cart of food. And he was having trouble with his card, and that happens. And he was, he was a bit concerned, and, and they were trying to work it out. And I just, my wife saw it happening more than I did, and she said to me after, on the way out, she said, the worker told him, don't worry about it, I'll pay 
for your food. One of the workers in that store, and they may be listening today, that worker said to this elderly man, don't worry about it. And he said, well, I'll come back and I'll pay you. No, 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 no. No, no, but I have to pay you. He was taken back by the gesture. And that worker said, no, I'm caring for your groceries. It wasn't just a can of milk. It was probably 50, 60. Well, that's only three items now, isn't it? 60 or 70 dollars. <laughs> but it was a fair-sized purchase. And I, I was thinking about this sermon when I saw that, and I said, that's Jesus at work. And as far as I know, yeah, I know, because I know the person who did it. That person is a believer, a follower of Jesus. And they didn't do it because the pastor was there. I don't think they even saw us. They do it because they were prompted to do. And God will bless that person for it. Amen? That's mercy. That's kindness in action. And that's what we are called to do to love on others, and to be kind and good. And before this day is out, someone might be put in your path. And you had to use wisdom. I know there's, we, we sometimes be afraid of take, being taken advantage of. Well, let me say this. How much was Jesus taken advantage of? If you do something as you feel prompted, as you walk in the Spirit, this is the key. As we walk in the Spirit and we are prompted by the Spirit to, re, to respond to somebody in need, I'm telling you, don't worry about if you're being taken advantage of. If you're doing what God is directing you to do, all is good. Leave that all in God's hands. My approach has always been, I'll do what God leads me to do. I'll leave the rest to Him to sort out. Be good, and, be good and be kind. It's a mark of a true follower of Jesus. Secondly, a true follower of Jesus will extend love and grace to those who sin. That's what mercy means. That's the second way that Jesus' followers will show mercy is by extending love and grace, mercy to those who sin. See, how often are we too prone to condemn those who sin? Maybe you don't, but maybe we're quick to pass judgment. There are times when we take the approach the Pharisees did in another instant and record in the last part of chapter John 7 and John 8. It says, one day, uh, they brought a trembling young lady who had been caught in the act of adultery into the temple and flung her before Jesus and they shouted, stone her, stone her. This lady was guilty of adultery and they said, stone her. Jesus knelt on the ground, it says, and he wrote something on the ground. You ever wonder what he wrote? My mind goes there. What did he write? I read somewhere some, one time that maybe... He wrote a list of the sins of those who are demanding that he stone her to death. Think about that. Maybe he just wrote a list of sins. You want me to stone her because she's committed adultery, but you have stolen, you have broken all the other commandments, and you want me to allow you to stone her to death? He wrote on the ground. Then Jesus looked up and said, let him who is without sin. I mean, Jesus was cool, wasn't he? I mean, he had them. They were trying to trick him, but Jesus turns the tables and he says, let you who is without sin cast the first stone. I, I, I get amazed by that story. I can see these Pharisees now. I mean, they're saying, stone her. She's an adulteress. Stone her to death, Jesus. Let us do it. We'll, we'll. And he says, okay, you that are without sin. I can see them now just <clears throat> a little bit awkward now. Gets real quiet in the room. Nobody's saying a word. You that are without sin. Think about it. If they cast the first stone, they're, being, they're, they're blaspheming, basically saying that they have no sin. So nobody dared take up a stone. Jesus had them right where he wanted them. No way were they going to cast that stone. But Jesus said to the woman, I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. You see, go and sin no more means that Jesus wasn't condoning the sin. He was saying, what you did is wrong, young lady. Adultery is a sin. I do not condemn you, but go and sin no more. He warned against the dangers of sin, and he preached the message of repentance. But Jesus showed mercy to the sinful woman. He showed mercy to me. He showed mercy to you. Aren't you glad for that this morning? As a sinner, he showed mercy. But sometimes we see people who sin, 
And we like to become judge and jury, or jury and judge. We like to be the one to pass sentence like these Pharisees did. Woe is me. Who am I to cast the first stone? Who am I to say to you, oh, you, you're a sinner and you have no right to be here today or have no right to be a child of God? We all sin from time to time. Paul gave this instruction in Galatians 6 and 1. And this is talking about sin in the church. He said, if someone is caught in a sin, and this would be a good expository sermon here, but I don't have time to get into that this morning. He says, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore them gently. Yes, I know there's such a thing as discipline, church discipline and so on, and we have to take responsibility for our actions. But folks, let me tell you this morning, our responsibility as believers and as leaders is not to push people away because of their failings and their sin, but it's to bring them closer, to bring restoration. It's restorative. It's to bring them deeper into the relationship with God. It's not to push them out of the church, but it's bring them closer in their deeper in the relationship with God. Can I get an amen to that this morning? Because all around us, there are going to be people who fail. If we're going to reach people in our community, we're going to be bringing people in whose lifestyle may not be conducive to what we think should reflect a lifestyle of a Christian, and it may take some time for them to grow and to develop in their walk of faith, and they may mess up. Who doesn't mess up? Is that right grammar? Who don't mess up? We fail. But when we see somebody who fail, sometimes we're easy to say, okay, you're done, you're out. You, you don't pass the test. Out you go. You have no place. That is not the family of God. That is not what Jesus teaches. That's not what the apostles taught. The apostle Paul said, you that are spiritual, you that are mature in your faith, come alongside that person who has failed and messed up. Do not be a judge of them. Yes, you must deal with it as leaders. We do. But you bring them along in their journey of faith. You, there's too many people that have been hurt in the church. I don't mean just mean specifically WPC, but the church over the years, there have been people that have been hurt in the house of God who have been pushed out. But we need to bring them closer and restore them. But for the grace of God, go I, Pastor Derek. We all fail. We need someone to pick us up when we do. That's what Jesus did. That's what mercy does. And thirdly, Third way, and with this, we'll clue it up in a moment. The third way that followers of Jesus will show mercy is by extending forgiveness to those who hurt them. And that's the tough one. People hurt us. What do we do about that? We must forgive. That can get tricky sometimes. That can be tough to do. Because we still, as we journey in this walk of faith, we still struggle with the flesh. And, and sometimes the flesh really takes a lot of control. And, and we look at things from a fleshly perspective, a worldly, sinful nature perspective. And there's a tendency in all of us, maybe, if we dwell there long enough, to retaliate, to get back. And sometimes we have the power to punish. Sometimes we have the power to hurt others by our words. There used to be a saying, we, I don't know if we hear it as much now, but when I was a kid, we used to use this saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. One of the biggest lies that was ever concocted. I've had people say to me, Pastor, I'd rather be beaten with sticks and stones than be told what I was told. Names, words will never hurt me. There's power in words to bring life and to bring death. There's so much power in this little muscle that you hold between you, in your mouth this morning. This organ called the tongue. The Bible says, James said, and we can look at this another time, but he basically made some strong language. He said, really, without God's control, it's set on the fire from hell, really. That this piece of muscle in my mouth called the tongue, man, it can do so much damage. It can bring grace and mercy and kindness and speak love and forgiveness or it can destroy. Do people ever hurt you? Have people hurt me? Yes. What do we do? We must forgive. And that puts the responsibility back on us. You say, Pastor, so-and-so did that to me and i got to forgive them? 
But they did it to me. What do we do to God? We abandon Him in the garden. We sin. We hurt God. But guess who forgives us? God. He forgives us. Someone hurts me, the responsibility is on me to forgive them. I know people that have held grudges against people and they still, what scares me is that they still believe that they're in a right standing with God. Let me say something to you and I'll be blunt this morning. I'm going on holidays, so no. I would say this even if I wasn't. If you're holding the grudge, you haven't forgiven. And if you haven't forgiven, you're not in a right relationship with God. There's something missing. If you have not forgiven the one who hurt you, and I've known people that have carried grudges for years, year after year, and even that even exists in the body of Christ. Let's be honest. Let's not ignore it. Let's address the elephant in the room, if you would. People come to church Sunday after Sunday in our churches and they can't even look at the next person in the pew because there's so much animosity between them. Do you think God is going to honor that? That can't happen. Am I wrong? No, I don't think I'm wrong. We have to forgive. Say, Pastor, yeah, I'll forgive them, but I can't forget. And when that's said like that, it's almost like a, a little bit of disclaimer, a little bit of a threat, Right? Well, I'll forgive them, but I'm going to hold it against them. Well, you haven't forgiven them. You say, Pastor, I can't forget intellectually or mentally. No, you can't. When, God, when the Word says that God will not, hold, will not remember our sins against us, is that doesn't mean that God can't remember because He's God. He can remember. What does He do? He chooses not to. He chooses not to sit there after church this morning and, and, and think about a litany of reasons why you shouldn't, for, you shouldn't forgive. Somebody hurts you? It's clear. No ambiguity about it at all in my mind. It's not a gray area. It's black and white. Anybody hurts me, I must forgive them. That is a virtue of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, our greatest example, when He's on the cross, Man, he's been, he's been mutilated, beaten beyond recognition, tortured, even before he gets to the mountain. Even before he gets to Golgotha, at the whipping post, he's beaten beyond recognition. His organs are exposed because of the whipping and the lashing. And he struggles his way through the mountain with leaving a trail of blood behind, blood that he shed for us. He's beaten to a state of unconsciousness. Jesus must have been so fit physically, Pastor Barry. Because if that was me, I probably would have died at the whipping post. Jesus must have been in good shape. But he meandered his way up Golgotha's hill with a trail of blood flowing behind them. And then they took him and they nailed him to a cross. And before he drew his last breath, as he tried to lift his body up before they, well, they broke his legs after he was dead, but as he tried to lift his body up to get another breath, because suffocation would be the cause of death, really. He said, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. No matter what anybody has done to you, nobody has done anything as extreme as that. And I've seen people lose out with God, lose out with others, lose out with the church. Because of what started out in some cases be minor things. But as they dwelled on that, as they thought about it, as they added to it, that little mole became a molehill became a mountain. And now they figure there's no way back. Forgiveness is a powerful thing. To look at somebody and say, I forgive you. Don't look at anybody and say, I forgive you, but simply, I forgive you. That's what mercy is. And I can read verse after verse after verse in the Gospels and the Epistles where we're told directly and when we're told through stories and parables about the danger of unforgiveness. There are people today that are in prison. And I don't mean a prison cell 
of brick and mortar and bars. But there are people, there are followers of Jesus who have locked themselves in a prison emotionally and spiritually because of unforgiveness. And they can never feel God's grace for themselves. They could never experience a sense of relief because they've locked themselves, locked themselves. They have become warden, and they have become prison guard. They have become key holder to their own cell. Until they break that, they'll never be free. I'm talking to someone today, maybe there or maybe here, that there's someone in your life that you have to forgive. You will never experience the fullness of God through Jesus Christ if you refuse to give the one who's hurt you. You'll never experience it. I'm not saying you won't go to heaven, but I want to go to heaven a singing and a shouting. I don't want to go to heaven head of a prison house of unforgiveness, but I want to go to heaven growing deeper in my knowledge of God. And that means forgiving the one who has hurt me. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be, shall be experience mercy themselves. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. I want you to stand. I want the worship team to come back. I'm going to just feel to wrap this up here. You stand with me. The blessing of this one is this. Those who are merciful will receive mercy. See how it works? Think about it now. We're talking about our relationship with each other. When we show kindness to others, this is not the motivation behind it, but when we show kindness to others, they will show kindness to us. When we pick up those who are, are, fell, are fallen because of sin, when we sin, someone will pick us up. When we forgive others, we will need forgiveness. I, I can't imagine what it's like to live knowing that I may have hurt somebody and they have not forgiven me. Just as I want to forgive, I want to be forgiven. In case you're wondering, I've had to say to people, I'm sorry. And I've had to ask for forgiveness. And as a release comes with giving forgiveness as well as receiving it, they will obtain mercy. They will obtain mercy. When Jesus wrote this beatitude, or when he spoke these words, you know, the Romans were in charge and there was something weak about being merciful. At the time, the Romans were, especially the military, they were the most cruel kinds of people. Those in leadership, they had no time for mercy and grace. They will stomp down, tread on, kill, destroy. It was weak. It was weak to show mercy. But what I've been saying throughout this series, Jesus came to turn all that upside down. The kingdom of this world, he came to turn it upside down. And he said, no. It is forgiveness and mercy to show that. That's a sign of strength. Because it's what God wants. As you live out your life today as a follower of Jesus, wherever life takes you, Whatever you're dealing with, and you know, there's dynamics in every church, there's dynamics in every family. You may be dealing with something in your family today that I don't know anything about, but you're struggling in this area of extending forgiveness and mercy. Maybe there's someone in your, on your street, in your neighborhood, who needs you to show compassion in a tangible way. When you leave this place this morning, will you? Will you pray that God will give that opportunity and give you the strength and grace to do it? If you're listening today, I was going to say by television, but if you're listening online today or if you're in this audience and you don't know Jesus, you haven't even begun this journey of faith, before we sing, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do just that, to give your life to Christ. He gave his life for you. You say, Pastor, I'm bringing so much baggage when I come to faith. That's why I can't do it. Bring it all. Leave it at the altar. Leave it at the cross. 
And Jesus will meet you there. He will help you and we will help you. You say, Pastor, I got to forgive some people. He'll help you with that. Pastor, I got to change. No, you can't do that. You will never change, but Jesus will change you because we cannot change ourselves. I encourage you to begin this journey. If you want to do that, pray this prayer with me. Father, I recognize I'm a sinner. I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die and he rose again. I confess my sin to you today. I confess my need of a Savior. And I ask you to cleanse me and to live with it in my heart by the Holy Spirit and help me with this new journey that I'm on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, simple. Let us know and begin this journey. Now let me pray for you as followers of Christ. In a moment we're going to sing, Oh, to be his hand extended. An old song, what a prayer. Reaching out to the oppressed. Let me touch him. Let me touch Jesus. You see, before you can minister to others, you have to have a relationship, really, a deep relationship with God. Before you can minister effectively, we're singing in a moment. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the opportunity again to break it, to teach it. And I pray, God, that what I've said today will find a place in all of our hearts. And everything I've said, I speak to me as well. May we be people that are merciful, show acts of kindness, forgive others, pick people up who need grace and strength. May this church, may WPC be your hands extended in our community this, day, this week. May we find opportunity as we open up our hearts to you to be Jesus in this ungodly world. Lord, I pray for the church now as as I begin some time of, of, of vacation, I pray for Pastor Derek and Pastor Andy and the board as they give leadership. And, and they will just continue, Lord, to experience the goodness of God. Bless your people, Lord. Minister to everyone. May be, we be the people you want us to be. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Let's sing it before we leave this morning. Oh, to be his hand extended. Can you do that this morning? Though to be his hand extended, reaching out to me, oppressed. Oh, let me touch him. Let me. Others 